He was always starting the, the hillman, the crank. And myself and Jared, not knowing any better, we, we, we took the crank one day, thinking he wouldn't miss it. And geez, he went absolutely spare looking for the crank. And we were, we, did, we didn't own up, you know. We went for ages without owning up. We eventually had to own up, of course. And uh, so I'll never forget that crank. I suppose it killed him eventually in one way. <clears throat> he used about uh, four or five spoons of sugar in his tea. And he'd have no milk, maybe a teaspoon of milk. But picture now, typically four or five spoons of sugar, <clears throat> which was very bad, obviously. When if she said, if she said, will you stop doing that, that'll kill you. He'd throw in another two just to, to wind her up. <laughs> First at the hairpin, I had to break hard. Then barely stalling to give right of way at the staggered cross five miles from the, from the track. Such that you were finally jolted, perhaps out of running in your head the impending race, outmatching my favourite FM rock. You, attack, you attacked me, sounding like you might crack. For fuck's sake, Sterling Moss, will you slow down and give Chaddy some sort of chance in the back? everyone, you're very welcome to the latest episode of Parlay with Padre Podcast. Don't forget to like, subscribe and click the notifications bell so don't miss any videos and updates. This week I'm delighted to be joined by West Limerick poet and author Tom Maloney, who has very kindly agreed to come on to have a chat about his life and his work. He's also a cousin of mine, I believe the technical term is first cousin once removed, so first time having a family member on the podcast. So, Tom, thanks a million for coming on today. It's a pleasure. I, I was looking forward to it myself. I've seen a few of your podcasts. They're enjoyable. Thanks okay. very much. Um, and I'd just like to thank you as well for, before this podcast became a seed in the back of my brain a number of years ago, you put me in touch with Tom Ryan, who whom a very popular guest right, on, yeah. on the podcast show. So you kind of got the ball rolling with that. So thanks yeah. very much for that. And I've, I've seen that one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was very good, yeah. Especially his trip up north. I enjoyed that part where they had took the, the club up north and they were they had to uh, they they were basically ambushed, not physically now, but uh, in terms of the the Antrim boys were waiting for them to uh, let to fool them really. But Tom, I think, was up for it. Anyway, <laughs> you, you, you want to get up very early in the morning to catch Tom out, but, um, right, yeah. but if if you're if this interview goes down half as well as your namesake, we'll be doing very well anyway. So it would be a very different interview, but it's surely very... before we go any further, since last time I put an episode on air, a couple of this podcast guests have passed away. Former car caller, Teddy McCarthy, and most recently at the weekend, Jake Abraham, who was the very first guest in the podcast. Just want to pay tribute to those two guys for coming on at the time. And they're good friends of mine in life. I suppose the beauty of the podcast and recording the interview is the memories will last forever. We have the interviews with them. And I suppose that's one of the main reasons, I suppose, I've done the podcast was to collect people's stories and their memories. Do you know, do you know that they say that um, one of the reasons people write is to make themselves uh, immortal? So it could be equally said of what you're doing. You're making people immortal by recording uh, what you're doing, your podcast. As you say, that will always be there. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. so that's good. Yeah, and it's like the interview, the the interview that my granddad did there. That um, oh yeah, in the after in, in right, the yeah. there. That's yeah, it's timeless. Yeah, that's right. Time. It's brilliant. Yeah, it was very interesting. So, Tom, I hope I haven't given you the kiss of death by coming on. Time will tell. <laughs> I hope not. Since if I have, if you have, you have. If it happens, it happens. That's the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> good night. <laughs> I won't be going anywhere except Cleedy. Anyway. <laughs> You've described yourself in the past as a, a poet barbarian knocking at the gates of the cannon. And just like you did in Killing Time and over the course of this interview, we'll hope to look at ripping open the gates defence and get to the, the root cause, I suppose, of, of, of your work. And I suppose it's quite apt, really, when I read that about the poet barbarian, because 
Munster are playing the Barbarians later on this afternoon yeah. and you come into my head when someone contacted me with a spare ticket for Munster Barbarians last week and I called you no you, you weren't you had other plans which you wouldn't yeah. have made it anyway because you're doing the podcast today right. but uh, you came into my head for someone who'd be interested because of your work and you've mentioned you mentioned one or two poems about rugby and your poetry which we're going to chat about and a whole lot more today so yeah. but before we get stuck into it Tom we'll do the usual cheers and good health absolutely cheers good health to your work to your health, and long life yeah and keep writing so um, Tom I suppose just to give a bit of background Tom has released he's published two poetry books My Register in honour of his grocery shop he ran in Broadford he left out the cash you know he's no um <laughs> He's now retired from that and he's enjoying retirement, but he had the shot in Broadford for the bones of 40 years. Would that be correct, Tom? That's right. Uh, yeah, good 40. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that poem, My Register, uh, it's a peculiar title, but it has it has, it has has double meaning. I mean, it's my register on life as well as, as if it were a cash register, as if it were a register. And I've used the cash register metaphor for what's going on. In the in the poem itself, but, um, uh, you well, you, well, you dedicated that book to everyone who buttered your bread. So I think that was kind of a <laughs> that a, was a, the barbarian. You see, I, typically in those blogs, you will find something very deep and uh, a lot of bullshit. Really, it was some old they pull it from somewhere that's you know rubbish and meaningless old stuff. Whereas that's reality. I was doing it for all my customers, <laughs> so it was for <laughs> anyway. Oh, that's, yeah. that's 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 that book. I should have reassured you as well that this is an uncensored show as well. So if any bad language, if you feel like yeah. uttering bad languages, feel free. The door is open to. Yeah, that's, we don't want to be listening. Uh, we, we don't want to talk to those people anyway if they're that way inclined. So, yeah. <laughs> I like that opening too. I have that that's an epigram. My gift to them will simply be that I'm still alive. And I say, as I always do, that there's nothing like it. Yeah, I like that as well, actually. Yeah. I think kind of why I suppose why I like your work so much, Tom, is that I think your son Ed will testify to this. Say that we've quite we've a similar enough kind of sense of humor. I would say like in outlook, yeah. so I, I can relate to a lot of your um, a lot of the humor in your short yeah, stories sure. in, in particular there. So, sure. killing sure. time is the next one. Um, I just I'm going to put the links for this in the video description as well. And uh, yeah. this is I suppose above 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 in the mass rock in um top of Ashford Hill there and it's your late mother which we're going to talk a lot about yeah. some, during the interview and your nephew and one of my co other, other cousins my best friends Mike Michael, young Mike Keating that's right that's getting the nod from himself Um, is your first novel and the, the yeah. cover that has filmed a big show to Marie Keating your niece as well and my cousin very good friend as well who did the photography for, for all these as well by the way so that's right yeah. out. so that's above in um, Kalidi Graveyard, where yeah, right. my grandparents yeah. are buried, your parents are buried, your late brother yeah, is buried, right, who yeah. we're, we're going to mention. Well, we'll all end up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I have plot there yet myself. I need to. I need to. Yeah, you, you'll get in all right. You, you, you're cloning on your name. You're okay. <laughs> I, I get in where water wouldn't. Um. So the the neatest book then is Polly the Ball and Lomu, yeah. direction of start story. So the model for the first cover of this would be Ed's dog. Moriarty, would that be correct? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I, I had the pleasure of Moriarty's company uh, for a number of nights. I was called for jury duty in Limerick five years ago, and because I'm okay. still on the register, I took it as an opportunity to uh, right. to great yeah. aid with my presence for a few nights. I wasn't yeah, actually nice. called, but but um, oh, yeah. he was a <clears throat> live wire. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's, he's good fun. I, I have him up in an outhouse at the moment, chewing a bone, so he's happy. Very good. So he's out of the way, but he's he's a house dog. He comes in. Very good. Anyway, that's Polly. Can I just ask? Is but his mention now? You mentioned the word chewing. Um, is that his real teeth or? Oh, oh they're his real teeth. Yeah. yeah. Well, I tell you, you yeah. wouldn't much need. It, it for... looks. It looks. It looks. Sorry. It looks. He looks savage enough there. Yeah, I was it's just going. Way, it's the way Marie did it, you know. I I'd say you wouldn't have much need for a burglar alarm anyway. If you, <laughs> if you give him... No, he has a great bath. Yeah. Yeah. Yourself. <laughs> so, I say that bone is getting ripped to shreds as we were talking there. So, <laughs> but anyway, Tom, I have a prediction. Maybe in the next twenty years, hopefully, yeah. maybe oh, yeah. it'd be posthumously for yourself. Hopefully not, because the Cronins live late to their nineties. The Cronin and the breeding, but it could right, be. It could, say that. it could be a question, 
in future leave and sort honors English that Rahina had a big impact in Tom Maloney's poetry mm. discuss. Yeah, absolutely. It, it has, of course. I mean, uh, it's well known. I, I, I talked to a lady years ago. She was she actually was editor of the Ar of Ireland's own. She was down in Limerick uh, at the White House, and uh, she was saying that um, it's well established that you have enough material to write about for the rest of your life from the first 11 years of your life. And that's absolutely true. If you delve back into it, it's all there and it's wonderful stuff. You know, you can, yeah. you can make something of it. So that, that's what's going on in a lot of my stuff. I presume a lot of it is, is when I was a kid. So anyway, that's... Uh, so I, I was saying to you earlier, I could start at the very beginning. And as it happens, I, I was born in, in on the 22nd of October, 1952. And as it happens, when Bat died, Bat Cronin, my uncle, your uncle, once removed, he um, <clears throat> he used to, I never knew, but he used to keep diaries. He has a handful of diaries. And Eile Bat gave me his diaries. And I have the diary of 1952. And I, I maybe, he, he, that's another thing I've, I've noticed reading these little pieces. There was a touch of um, of, 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 of Twitter about him. He was way ahead of his time. Everything was briefly said, just little just little tweets. Um, for example, the 1st of January, 1952. I went to second mass in Ashford. Pat, Joan and I went down to Milan's and to town. We, went, we caught a tree going into the flat. He obviously had a flat in Newcastle West. And um, we collected from Mrs. Milan coming out coming on, on the way out, uh, we were preparing for Kay's wedding, which was the following day. So on the 2nd of, of, of January, my father and mother got married, 1952. And it says on his on his tweet, Kathleen and Eddie Maloney were married in, at Newcastle West Church, and we had breakfast in Limerick, Flintworth, and I met the McCanns. That was the end of it. So if we fast forward then to the 22nd of October, 1952, big day for me, this is his tweet. News. Young son for, young son for Kathleen, uh, born in Cork. I drove Eddie and my father, that would be your great-grandfather, and Patty to Cork. Uh, turned out very wet, and we st I stayed in town. Now, you, that's the thing that's running through his, his, his diary all the time, the weather. He's always mentioning the weather, and invariably it's wet. <laughs> so nothing has changed in that regard. You're, you're born 22nd of October, so happy birthday yeah. in advance. Your parents didn't waste yeah. any time anyway, just doing a quick calculation. That's actually why uh, that, that was a close call. Uh, <laughs> and in those days, it was going to be within the parameters. But anyway, <laughs> um, as far as my father got down to business. <laughs> um, and just while we're on the, on, on, on the diary of that year, I'll go to the 22nd of December. It says here, at four o'clock in the morning, after the dance, obviously the dance at the hall, we had to go for the nurse and doctor, Mrs. Cronin, young son. I went to town with Patty. That was my own dad's birthday that you mentioned there, 22nd. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And he goes, he was went by Noel, but actually his correct name is Dennis Noel. Not many that's people right, that, yeah. So we'll... <laughs> that was it. Well, one more tweet, I think to the 12th of June, uh, January. The only entry I see... In that respect, the 12th of January, uh, he had an entry. I won't, I won't read it at all. There's not it. But at the end of it, it says, not paid. He was after doing a journey to, to, to Charleville, to, uh, to the railway, and at the end of it, not paid. From what I've heard about that, he could get quite sore about that kind of stuff, I'd say, you know. So. Well, he'd be sensitive about that, but he'd be quiet about it. Actually, I have never seen him to get mad, really, except once. And this will lead me into that poem, Bats, Bats Black... Um, Love, right? We were we, we normally used, my mother invariably went to uh, Ballybunion the last two weeks in July. That was written in stone. But one year I think there was something wrong in 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 Ballybunion. I think there was an outbreak, an outbreak of typhoid or whatever, <clears throat> and she uh, decided to go to Yall. So we know obviously she she picked um, she picked the same two weeks. But we went to Yall anyway, and uh, it turned out she obviously did her did her her her, her uh, <clears throat> booking. Through the Cork Examiner, as it was called that time, and we ended up 
in the middle of nowhere outside your town, right, which didn't suit her at all. But anyway, that's, that's beside the point. But Bat, of course, was with us because he drove us down and stayed for the two weeks. But the point is, and this is where my poem comes from, his crank, you know, he was always starting the, the hillman, the crank. And myself and Jared, not knowing any better, we, we, we took the crank one day, thinking he wouldn't miss it. And geez, he went absolutely spare looking for the crank. And we were, we did, we didn't own up, you know. We went for ages without owning up. We eventually had to own up, of course. And uh, so I'll never forget that crank. I read that poem for the first time. I actually looked up, was Hilma a country in Africa, which I hadn't quite heard of. <laughs> and the the reasons for that will become quite clear as uh, Tom will know. Hilman, Hilman Mordecai. Actually, Uncle Dan was absolutely raving mad about that poem. In fact, so much so that they put that collection, uh, my register, into his coffin. That's how that other poem uh, that's about Dan came came to being. Um, they, they told me, and for, the priest told me it was being put into the coffin. And apparently when he was ever feeling down, he used, Joan used to read that poem to him. And that was his, that was his point. He he saw he saw a bat in that poem, uh, twisting the, the clank, you understand? So he obviously it brought up memories for Dan. So this is the poem, Bat's Black Love. In 1963, my uncle loved. She was a black hillman. Though not his wife, she pleased him as he drove along the roads. He took great care at all times not to abuse. Most notably that summer, I recall the ritual of her starting up before she would respond. He would take off his coat roll up his white shirt with sleeves, then reach for his crank from under the driving seat. Eyes transfixed, tantric breaths coming alive. He'd insert his crank to the discreet hole at the front, and oh my God, how he'd heave round and round, listening to her grunts, for they gave promise, till eventually the glorious moment of her start up, like a honeybee, she would be humming. That was him, man. <laughs> well, your tongue was firmly in your cheek when you wrote that time, anyway. And I suppose there is a lot of there's a lot of innuendos, a lot of there is indeed, oh, yeah, and Dublin yeah. haunt very <laughs> much in that poem there. Which it which... wouldn't be a bad, you know, if, if he knew I was going on like that, he 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 he'd faint. <laughs> Actually, that's another thing in his in his um in his diaries, a regular uh, confession goer. I mean, every every nearly every second week went to confession. Uh, first mass in Ashford was quite popular with him as well. Anyway, that was poor man. I thought he was so, having an interracial fling there, which would have been a bit uncommon in the nineteen forties, fifties. So, mind you, mind you, we didn't really know about as a young man. Obviously, uh, his, his brothers and my, the other, the generation before me did. But when we, when I knew about, like he had become more reserved, and and um, he didn't show himself like when he was younger. He, for example, I, I would have never thought Bat would go to a picture, uh, you know, I'd go to the pictures in the Castle West. But there was one weekend there, he went on Friday night, Saturday night, and he went again on Monday night. He went quite frequently to the pictures, which is the thing that was a big surprise to me. So, it's, but uh, that was, that was no, he's got the, a few, uh, sorry, um, dances as well. He went to a lot of dances. Uh, Abbey Field, Fianna Fáil dancers, Belly Bunyan, Distol. So he, he, he was a busy man. He was always moving car. And of course, the other thing about the car was if he was break down and he was forever going to garages and putting oil in and doing it himself. And he, he, even to the, I said at the time he died, he was always titivating with his car, whichever car he had. Speaking so of fast cars, I suppose something you may or may not know, but my granddad inherited Bats Starlet. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, so that was right, yeah. The first that car that I right. ever drove and was insured on yeah, was oh, actually yeah. Bat, so a car that's yeah. it. I had yeah. one or two yeah. narrow scrapes with it. Is that right, yeah. Narrow scrapes, and I, I suppose I won't go into too much detail, but the, I can tell you that it was made of stern stuff, is all I would kind of say. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well minded with Bat. I remember it all right. He's got brought for it. Because like a new car at seven, you've got it. Before we leave Bat, you want to do the war wounds? The, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I read Bat's war wounds off. Now, there's an interesting uh, backstory to this one. Uh, Bat, in the 40s, obviously, he was still working in the farm. And um, I don't know if this actually happened now, but he, he fell off a, 
about car and he, he hurt his he hurt his elbow. I'd say he broke his elbow actually. But I suppose in those times things weren't properly mended at all, which was mended all right. And he was able to use it afterwards. But uh, thereafter, and 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 and, and your, your your uncles and would know this now, and Noel would know it. He had a big uh, a big lump in his in his in his, in his um his elbow. But as I say it, it was functional, so there was no problem. But I mention that because it comes up in the poem. So that happened in the, in the forties with this this. This cob, they had this horse who was, who was, my mother said he was a bit flighty and you know, he fell off the, the horse uh, with the butt car. He must have been standing on the bus rather than sitting down, you see. Anyway, um, in the 60s, then we used to be in Lahina with my mother behind with us. Uh, we had a, a truck, we had a truck uh, outside, outside in the backyard, just beyond, outside the, the window of the, um, of the bathroom for water coming in. There was no there was no limit counting council around. So the water came in to the bathroom too. The truck was filled up with say the water, natural water, rain water. And there was a, a bar joining, obviously for the water joining the, the bathroom with the truck. But Bat had this wonderful habit of uh, showing how gymnastic driven he was. He'd jump up on the on the bar and he'd do a few twiddles and he'd come down straight better than any of those Olympians. Uh, and we were able to do it, I say, well into his forties. So that's that's the backstory. Bat's war wound. After her Hitler's army marched across the Polish border, the Luftwaffe in the air, the Doyle introduced the emergency. Neutrals at home followed the far off clouds, but more in your line, you tackled the cob. To this day, mother holds that he was flighty. Defiant, you stood stood on the bus anyway. Maintained a firm pull on the reins, the village innocent of the Blitzkrieg, a blue sky complementing its peace, till your butt car bumped over a pothole, just as a plane appeared over the hill, and as you gazed amazed, the cob bolted. You, being a first-time vaulter, helpless fell. Spar two, no more like a pole on a cob drawn butt. You turned to gymnastics in the 60s on the bar that joined up the water truck to our house with a perfect 10 could lock your two feet then jump off in front of us. Mother liked to amuse, albeit Riley, that you could have been in the circus but for the war. Grinning at the thought you would friction massage your elbow proudly point to the spot the knuckle the shot of pain brought up from memory, how your pothole fall never healed properly, how hard lump apart you got off lightly, how the world changed in the emergency. That's, That's very what good. I want. <laughs> Did Bat have any entry for or Lizzie's coronation date, 1952? I suppose they hadn't. Well, uh, Queen Elizabeth? She was she was crowned in 1952. Yeah. What, what, what date was that? Do you know? I was, actually, was. I was actually being Roy there, but I'll, I'll have a look there. Queen I, I, I would doubt it. I, I'd nearly have seen it. No, I don't think he did. He, look, he actually said it in the poem, look, that last poem I read. This is relevant. It's relevant for the Cronans, actually. He more or less said that to me. This is more general. But more in your line, you tackle the cob. In other words, you weren't one bit interested in all this crap was going on in the world. You had your job to do. And he told me one time that... Um, you, my grandfather, your great grandfather, was had bought the the the, the, um, the farm in Raheen and they were already in Nakhu in, in Nakhera. and um, like they were under pressure financially when he did that because times were bad. And I said they were working their knuckles to the bone, and they had much time for uh, the war of independence and and all that kind of thing that was going on around them. They were busy, and so that that gene is in the crown, as I say. Since Uncle Tom had that gene, do you understand? My yeah. mother had it. So that that gene, get on with your life and and, and don't be getting up too late in the morning. That's that was the attitude uh, yeah, for uh, them, and I say uh, always was. And my father says as well, saying he used to have and still has. We've not been doing to look after ourselves, you know. So that's that's, that's the, right. So that's it, that's that's in that poem, as I said. I actually looked it up there for the record. Like Queen Elizabeth wasn't crowned until the second of June, nineteen fifty-three. So that would have that were, were, were a year early. But she was yeah. she was a reigning monarch in nineteen fifty-two. So I just said I'd, yeah, yeah, I'd yeah. ask. 
So Batty would have been quite close to Tom. Like, and I suppose you you do bear a physical resemblance to him as well. Which I do, yeah, that's yeah. right, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and he wasn't tall, neither was I. And I think my grandfather Dennis wasn't tall either. Bat would would be more like um, my grandfather Dennis Dinny, as they called him. Mm. That's they referred to as. Um, so that's that's I mean that lines as well was. But my father's uh, side of the family and my own children uh, are tall, and that's coming from from the Maloneys. When uh, I mean, Uncle Dennis was tall, and so was your father, but Bat wasn't. And I say I I definitely have some of Bat uh, Bat's gene and genes in me, you know. Very good. Um, you mentioned your grandfather there. He would have been quite young when you passed away. What kind of memories do you have of? He was nineteen fifty eight, when February fifty eight, I think. Um, I barely remember him, but I do remember him. As you say, I only have been five and a half years old when he died. Uh, but I do remember, and I remember the butt car and he, he, he tackling the donkey and he'd come back to the village from from, from the farm. And um, he was a quiet man, he was smoking his pipe. And um, I, I remember he, you would get the smell of, of tobacco from him, you know, distinctive. Uh, it was actually, <laughs> I liked the smell, as it turns out. Uh, but he had that. Uh, and he was coming into the, into the kitchen with, with a Rayburn, uh, so he'd sit down there. But he, he, he was like Bat. He was he was basically quiet, as, as I remember him, and as much as I remember him. One thing I was very proud of about your grandfather and my great grandfather was that he stood up yeah. to the church when opened oh, the dance hall yeah. because there was massive opposition to that. Right. From the time that he was denounced from the pulpit, a really? couple of times, like you know. I know that now, yeah. And so I suppose it was controversial enough to set up a dance hall in the nineteen thirties, and yeah. In Ireland ruled by De, De Valera and, right. and that, you know. So I well, the thing is that he had to earn his crust here. I think sure as that told me the times were tough, you know. It was a way of making a few shillings, so why not? Yeah, I suppose the Ireland of De Valera and Charles McQuaid and that, it took balls to stand up to the church, so something yeah. very yeah, proud of. Right, yeah. I also, I can remember, believe it or not, 1956, for some reason, I mean, this, I find this fascinating that I did, I can't, um, I remember my father taking me, which was really a crazy thing in many ways, getting me out of bed uh, three and a half, four years, 1956 uh, Olympic, uh, 1500, uh, what was this called, for the meters of time at the time, uh, Ronnie Delaney winning the gold medal. And I heard this on radio, it probably didn't mean much to me at the time, but I, he often talked about it, to the, to the big thing. I said it was a big thing for the country, uh, I, uh, Ronnie Delaney winning that, because I actually met a man lately, John Cousin, actually, in Newcastle West. He told me he got up for it, and he remembers it very well. And he'd be older than me now, but um, probably was in his teens at the time. So, obviously, people, there was no television, of course. It was just the old radio. So, I, I think I think Uncle Dennis was at it. I think he was at it. I'm not 100% sure about that, but my mother said he was at it. You don't know what year he went to Australia, do you? I don't actually. It was something to look a bit of a just to, for the for the viewers there. Tom's uncle Dennis lived in Australia for a good number of years. He would have immigrated quite. Yeah, he went over you know. in the fifties. Yeah. What you said there just clicked to switch when you said February nineteen fifty eight, and that would have been the same month as the Munich air disaster. So that just came into my head. Oh yeah. yeah. And I suppose one fact about your grandfather that he went to Chicago as a young man. He did, that's and, right, yeah. And he had to come back to take over the farm, and yeah, I'd say that, that that's was something, right, yeah. I think he felt a level of resentment around around yeah. that, maybe having to come back to take over the farm, and, but my, my father has a copy of a reference he got from an employer um, okay. over in Chicago, which, and um, very he spoke very highly of his yeah. work ethic and very capable man, and yeah. so... We'd all, be, we'd all be yanks if he'd stayed over. Yeah. Do you know what? Given the way that we, given the way that, uh, given the way that things are going over there, I'm glad he came back. To be honest, but um, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> that poem inspired. We move on to another of your uncles, Dan. So at the end of the removal, yeah. so your thing. So the launch for that book would have been November 2009, and Dan passed away in July 2010. Yeah. So this is what this poem is based on now at the end of the removal. That's right, yeah. And, and I actually have, I have a personal connection to this story as well with you, Tom, which you may have forgotten about, but um, the day Dan was buried in Tullalee Cemetery, is it? Is it? Yeah, that's right. Tullalee, it's not Tullalee, yeah. yeah. yeah right. So myself and John Keating, another nephew of yours, yeah. we travelled to the graveyard together and we met you on the way in and right. you asked us royally 
had we been digging the grave, another reference to Hamlet, you know. So, <laughs> uh, so I, I, I am, um, and that's another thing actually, which I meant to say about, and you mentioned about bats getting to the point, the tweets and that, and there's a, there's a Hamlet yeah. quote for Polonius, yeah. or was it Hamlet? I forget who said it, but brevity is the soul of wit. So that kind of yeah. reminded yeah. me of that. So that's another thing I enjoy about your work is the yeah. the, the Shakespeare references, the Hamlet that you can. Well, the, the reference here is to, uh, is I, as far as I know, is to uh, <clears throat> the boat. The boat is uh, is in, yeah. in mythology that the boat is uh, taking taking souls across the river Lit. Um, yeah. to obviously to in no way I was just saying I was just using that as an yeah. example of Shakespeare yeah sure yeah. Now that that boat and, and, and the guy who, who drives the boat uh, is mentioned in my father's poems so anyway, at the at the end of the removal in memory of Dan Cronin Father Frank blesses Dan hands him over on this side of the river remains to be seen no more everybody is standing Foregoing waving, many sobbing for their memories. Sharon couldn't care less that what I'd written lies closed on Dan's lap. That Dan will quote me on the boat to whoever will listen. That when they reach the other shore, he'll again want to open the one about Bat, his older brother. Read about his documented affair in 1963 with, of all things, a black hillman. It will continue to amuse Dan no end, and more so even as he pauses to remember the way a bat turned at the crank, heaving it round and round. In between, he'll see old faces, gauge his generation waiting at the dock, and rest assured, someone will lift the lid, confide to Dan that the hillman is still running on the same page. Yeah, I, I I really enjoyed that. I suppose because I had the I had the actual experience of being in the graveyard with you. Okay. Reading, right, reading, yeah. reading, reading back over that at the time. Close, you know. yeah. What was your what kind of relationship did you have with with Dan, Tom? Did you give um, any good memories of him? I, I I wouldn't say I I I didn't know Dan that well, but he he called to the shop now and again. He told me one time this one of the main memories I have uh, that he was. Um, he was looking at a farm. He was talking about Nakhera. He was looking at a farm down near Yaw, down that Blackwater Valley, obviously wonderful land. It was 800 pounds and he couldn't raise it. And he was absolutely, he went, he did everything he could to raise the 800 quid and he couldn't raise it. So if he'd bought that farm to be seriously a valuable stay, but that's, that's an abiding memory I have of him. Uh, so he ended up buying the, the pub in Newcastle West. Which didn't do too bad either. Now it must be said. Oh, that's a, that's that's a, that's a landmark. That's yeah. and, and his name is over the door, which is wonderful. Yeah. You know, that's fantastic. Yeah, it, yeah, it will I've, always be there. I hope. Well, I have great memories of meeting Dan. You know, and I suppose my father was very fond of him as well. And he always yeah. had great character and great wit. And that's as right, you yeah. as you said once, he enjoyed life. Like you know, so um. Oh yeah, yeah. He was very driven at the the, the second half of his life. Uh, you know, for people, for people to be be spacious, put it that way. You know, that people would. He had this attitude, and, and rightly so. You can't hold on, and uh, life is you know, it's so many years, and everybody, and no point in grasping things, which is absolutely right. I'd say he. I mean, as soon as he he he, uh, he dried up and so forth, he, he had this new mission, as it were, yeah. uh, to uh, convince people that life is short and that it should be lived to the full. And he did a lot of great work in helping people turn away from. Oh, absolutely! That's absolutely that right. Life. He did, yeah. I did, yeah. He, 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 that was part of us, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And I suppose while we're mentioning Dan, I suppose we might give a mention to his son Jory, who passed away. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I suppose I think Jory's life at some point might be might might be worth a poem potentially. You know, he didn't he didn't he lived sure, an interesting yeah. life. So yeah, yeah. But what, my my memory of the Newcastle people, of course, behind in Rahina. We were relatively insulated, and uh, soccer was a foreign game. This is when we were young now, nine, ten, that age level. And um, but the Cronins in Newcastle, Pat and Jerry, if they donated to more, less so maybe. Uh, he was probably too young. Uh, he was come out obviously to the farm and so forth, and out to the to, to the shop. But um, we called them the townies. But they were they were big fans of soccer. 
everything in nice side of castle was all about soccer and we knew nothing about it so we actually felt we were a bit fo foolish in a way and which we were i suppose that we were as sophisticated as them playing soccer we waited on our, our hurdles but that's the way it was no i suppose I, i'd be very we used to play soccer with them you know I'd be very friendly with Donny, his son, and Joan and, and Mary oh, as well. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. you know, so it's great. It's great to keep that link and Priscilla and Robbie and yeah. Wayne are doing a great job at the bar was, as well, to keeping a, the game going. Like yeah, there was a guy, uh, Jimmy Welsh, the, the 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 Newcastle club would know him. God rest him. Um, he used to travel for Nash's Mineral Waters, and um, he he actually was I'd say one of the driving forces of Newcastle West Soccer Club at the time, uh, but. He he used to come out, uh, obviously, delivering uh, Nash's Mineral Waters, and he would see me and he said, I saw you in the Castle West earlier today, meaning that he saw Pat Cronin. He thought we were very alike. And I wouldn't say that's true today, but when we were young, apparently, we were quite quite similar in looks. So yeah, I, I've heard that as, I've, I've heard that as, yeah. well, as well, yeah. yeah. Where I grew up in Rohina was next door to Cronin's Hall which your grandfather and later my own granddad ran. Um, yes. what, what memories do you have of Cronin's Hall, Tom? Um, I, I, I remember I remember actually summers um, touring companies used to come around uh, doing plays. They'd stay for a week and maybe more, and people used to come regularly. There's whole plays, you know, one-act plays in, in the hall. I remember that, and I, I remember us acting ourselves afterwards, maybe during the week, you know, copying them, imitating the, the actors. Um, I say when they just come around, they just be quite settled and they seem to like the place. Um, dances I don't have much memory of because uh, the 60s, I don't, I, I don't remember. I've been too young anyway, I suppose, but the 70s, it wasn't happening. At, you'd go somewhere else, you know. So in, in that sense, the dances were, I'd have been at, at a few dances, but not many. So I wouldn't have that many memories of it otherwise, apart from like what I said there, you know, we'd be going to the hall and full acting and whatnot, but not not at formal occasions. I remember seeing a, in the bar in Rohina, there was a plaque up on the wall about the Queen of Munster Festival, I think it was 1963, so Rohina had its own version of the Lovely Girls Contest in Father Ted there at one point, like, you know. Um I don't know if you remember that or not, but I don't remember that. Actually, that, that's that's something I have to say. I mean, just I've said it once or twice, and I said it one night at a, at a writer's book. <laughs> it's very sad, but it's true. There's a there's an element of truth in it. I, I would say I left I left the national school of like sixth class and all that, and I went into Saint Munchens, okay, and for five years. And that time when you went away to boarding school, you were basically away. For most of the year, we came home for the summer, all right. And of course, the Christmas holidays and a week at Easter. But the point is, there was no running home at weekends or any of that. So I basically, and then when I finished uh, Munchens, I went on to college in Cork. But I, I feel I left, when I left, uh, when I were left to go to St. Munchens as a boarder, I actually left home for good, for good. I wasn't part of the place anymore. Because I said, we went on down to college and then I ended up over here. And uh, my, my connection with uh, with Rahina was, was tenuous enough. Part was, uh, there were obviously the summer holidays. Uh, I, I was a, a big fan of greyhound racing and my father and myself used to go racing maybe twice a week and be galloping dogs and training dogs. So just about Cronin's Hall, I suppose, we're, in, we're talking about the uncles. Um, my own grandfather, Paddy Cronin. Yeah. Have you any memories of him or... Of, and he, you, 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 you wrote a poem about him, which we oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, but in I, general, I, wasn't so much the hard, but I'd be over there, I'd go over there in the summers, and uh, I'd, I'd be in my holidays over there, you know, staying over, I'd stay over. You didn't go too far, like, on your holidays. I did not, no, I didn't. But I, I remember uh, your grandmother, she just, of course, being out in the farm, you'd have a right appetite, you know, but I just love her, uh, she'd have a, uh, they they have the they kill the pig obviously and I was there for the killing of the pig a few times um and um with the the ba the yellow bacon would be hanging up in the kitchen and she'd take that down and she, she'd cut it for uh, for rashers Jesus they were nice rashers and we we had eggs and I'd say, I said I'm sure there were duck eggs there were lovely duck eggs cooked in that in the rasher uh, really tasty breakfast and brown bread she'd be baking her own brown bread so I remember that 
I also remember for some reason uh, in the winter time, obviously not where I live was once or twice, more than once or twice, say, um, with, with this mangler for, for breaking up turnips and mangles. You know what that was about? And your, your grandfather would be feeding the, the, the mangles, as he called them, as opposed to the turnips, really, to, uh, to the cattle. Obviously, getting rid of them, using them up, they were probably coming from the from the garden. And we, myself and Noel, a patch of probably be inside, inside in a shed uh, <laughs> in the depths of winter, playing with the mangle. I also remember the, um, obviously, saving the hay, hay and, and I, have, I, have, I have a reason to remember one, one, one event. I actually hurt my ankle. I was sitting in the back of the cock lifter, and whatever way he laid it down, he squeezed my ankle. My ankle got caught. She just squeezed and it swelled up. And today, you now I say there's a bit of arthritis in there, and I, I, I said that's when it happens. We saw to sit, which is something would obviously health and safety wouldn't allow today. We'd sit in the front of the tractor, you know, to keep the weight down when you'd have a heavy wine up in the up in the cock lifter, you know, coming down from the field, bring it into the barn. Myself and maybe one of the boys would be sitting in the front to keep the tractor from going back, because obviously there wouldn't be the tractors you'd have today. We turned the tractor here at that time was probably more basic. So I, I had memories like that. I remember the uh, the pond. The, the, there was a pond there between the school and just this and the this school side of the orchard. And uh, so there was nothing in there. Only maybe the odd frogs. Mick Welsh had a pond over as well. He was over there with our nets, <laughs> catching our fish. <laughs> so I don't know. My own father, but where I struck my my leg and it got caught. It wasn't the end of the world, but uh, but I'd say I I I I have a uh, now and again, it, it affects me. If I was standing too long, I was fine in the shop was standing too long. I'm sure it was, uh, it was it's a, it's a bit arthritic. It's not a big deal. I'm not lame or anything at all, but, you know, but it was there. But, but, but as a person, like, would you have any, would you have any kind of good, good memories of him now? Will say, or did, did he make any kind of in, impact on you? Like, or? I actually thought he was very laid back. You know, yeah. Possibly when he'd be coming into the house at home. Uh, and in general, he, he was laid back. You know, he was... Uh, he had time for, um, like Dan, I'd say all of them were that way on their own. My mother was that way to a point. She was probably a little bit more intense, a bit more passionate about religion and all that. But he, he was very balanced. I thought he was extremely balanced. You know, just, you know, it to be, everything will be fine. That was his, 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 his view of life. Everything will be grand. It will work out all right. Yeah. And so that's a good way to look at life, you know. I try to be like that myself if I can, but... Yeah. I suppose look, I he was a big influence in my own life. I suppose obviously as well as being named after him. I suppose would have grown up beside him, and oh yeah, yeah, we would have played many a game of cards and drafts that we'd keep oh, playing yeah. until I won. So we got to keep the two euro, and um, <laughs> and I look, we used to have great discussions about Irish history. And mind you, he yeah, wasn't sure. too he wasn't too happy with my enthusiasm when the Michael Collins movie came out because um, is that right, sir? He was very much in the Devil era he corner, was. and I don't think any yeah, of the yeah. Cronins would have would have been too happy with the ending of Pierce appears to Dev in your recent book because it kind oh, of yeah, yeah. That, that Dev <laughs> hasn't quite crossed over yet that he's kind of a, in purgatory somewhere. Yeah, yeah. but I, I suppose he was an important he was an important influence in my life, and I, I think he kind of shaped yeah. he shaped a lot of who I am. To be honest, like in yeah, terms of course, yeah, oh, absolutely. He would have. What age were you when he died? Seventeen, nearly. Oh yeah, he would have had a big influence on oh, absolutely yeah. my grandfather. Yeah. There was one instance in your book in when your short stories where someone was reading the death notices. Was that in Barney's? Oh, that's right. Born. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my grandfather had a great saying that I enjoyed when he was reading the death notices at home. He'd say, "I must see if any of my friends stop smoking." <laughs> Very good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Actually, I used to see. I, I, I mean, I, I I probably contributed to it in a sense, in so far as I was selling cigarettes. But I hear people who died and whatnot, or that came down with with the lad, as they say, and I'd know them. What would kill them? You know, they'd be dying young, fifties and sixties. Cigarettes are a real killer. What was this? What was the inspiration behind the Siege of Innes, the poem you wrote? Well, I had this, this vision of your father. You know, he he would, and and Dan was that way more so even. Uh, by all accounts, Dan used to go to uh, to Drum to uh, a, a, an old folks thing up to a few years before he died. And I was in the shop. I was sitting. All the ladies come in. They'd say he'd, he'd come across the room. He'd be he'd be swinging his hands 
to looking for a dance. He obviously loved to dance. But your your, your father was a, liked to dance as well. He liked to. Um, they, they, of course, they were weird. So they were weird in a dance hall in a way, you know. Your grandfather was. There was one Saturday night when I was about thirteen or fourteen. That I stayed up late. And there used to be a program on RTE at the time, a prayer at bedtime, only a four or five minute kind of talk of the day program. But one night, on that particular night, it showed footage from Drunkulter Daycare Centre and the two lads were there, my granddad and Dan, eating dinner. So I got a good laugh off that at the time. And um, <laughs> So will I read the Siege of Venice? Yeah. Um, in memory of Uncle Pay. Oh yeah, the, the poem itself came out of... Um, I was outside in the backyard. So that poem was written about two two years ago. I was sitting, uh, I wouldn't say walking around my own backyard and a lovely summer summer day, and um, I see the flies and the butterflies uh, flittering around, you know, like like a ballet. You know the way the flies go around. It. It's, just, it's like a dance. So that that's what reminded me. The siege of Venice, in memory of Uncle Paddy. Why they don't so much whittle the flies that is. More a ballet dance in the sun for all the world on the lawn. Still, they jig the memory, a late one, in Cronin's hall as the melodian squeals those opening notes of the reel. And under the influence, Paddy rattles a few taps, his hands like wings, his shoulders lifting, hugging his neck. The floor is tapping while his tongue to whirling and clapping excites the rhythm in his feet. He hoops before, come on everyone, one last dance, and forget about me brother, he's a TD, me boys. It's the Siege of Venice. And this, of course, he was, he was nearly internationally known for his, uh, his rendering of uh, my, my brother, he's a TD, me boys. Yeah. He sang that, I don't know you've heard that song. Yeah, I have, Did yeah. You... I, I actually sang it myself tonight at my own wedding, believe it or not. In, oh, no, in my... lovely. Oh, that's good. The three of us sleep together and put near us to the wall, and sometimes she doesn't know which of us is a member of the dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My brother is a TD, me boys. My brother is a TD. And when he's away in Dublin, there's nothing doing for me. The other night I popped into her. She began to roar and bawl. She said, young man, pop out again. You're not a member of the doll. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's really good. I'm sure he'd be delighted to hear as well that you were inspired by a couple of flies flying around the back garden that he, did, that he came into your head when he's arms. Um, so yeah, I'm sure he loved point. that. It's amazing the connection. I told you like that up to 11 years old. Um, the, the, the not, uh, Unrelated, not unrelated. Um, I don't know, it's just coming into my head now, but <clears throat> when I was a young fella talking about my ankle, I, I hurt my, uh, actually... This this affected me in my teens, in as much as my my athleticism was affected. Put it that way. Um, myself and Gerald were my mother, of course, being the holy lady she was. She would insist we go over and say a prayer before we went to school. So it was across the road. This is when we were in the so-called new school. I, I spent a bit of time in the the old school, as it was called as well. But anyway, in the new school, so we were crossing the road and. Um, I was at the, I was at the at the at the cross side, we'd say, and this lady came over the road. No, she wasn't flying, obviously. She was, I'd be dead. But uh, we were crossing the road, and she hit me on the on the left hip, on the left side of my my body, and uh, I say she did damage there. But I remember going back in anyway, and she drove away. She stopped all right. She, she stopped to the point where she hit me, but she didn't obviously blow me away. So I went into the into the into back into the into the shop and the kitchen and. Uh, they said you're probably all right. I probably should have been checked out, but I say, I mean, I eventually had a hip done there, uh, and I just get an awful pain regularly in my thigh. I, I say that that's what really was hit. My thigh was I dragged the muscle there. Something happened there because when, in my teens, I was I was I was, I was I was doing a lot of athletics, and I was playing munchers. We used to be playing rugby. I just get a pain down my leg, and I'd say that was the cause of it. But that's that's just a memory I have. And also regarding crossing the road, the the idea of crossing a road, when the Pope died, I said it must have been obviously Pope John the Twenty Third back in the early sixties. <clears throat> we were in school, obviously national school. I presumably about sixty three. Um, my father had had the dog. My father's 
uh, had a gun dog. She was she, she had a couple of gun dogs, but one of them was known as Pup. She was the, she was the blue bitch, and um, apparently uh, she did actually get get, get killed crossing the road. Right, and um, so the teacher asked one asked asked one of the boys, uh, "When did the when did the pope die?" To the time the pope died, so it was picked up as when did the pope die? So <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, the hand went up, crossing the road, sir. <laughs> and, uh, I think it was lovely. Anyway, that's that's I know how that came out. I just want to move on here to um so one one man who always kind of intrigued me was your was your dad Tom yeah I suppose sure. I would have been quite young when he died it would have, would have been only two years of age because he would have died in eighty nine okay. wasn't it yeah, yeah. I'm mean, I'm intrigued even more I suppose from reading your work because you can tell he was a a major influence in your life I'd sure, say yeah. a man you had a very good relationship as well by yeah, um. Sure, yeah. Just from a, f- a few passages, um, my my own father has quoted him a lot as well, which I'll go into shortly. But uh, just a couple of passages I kind of enjoyed in one of your short stories was when you were talking about you and Gerard, kind of talking to him about oh, yeah, your, yeah. any concerns or any issues you had at the time and or giving sharing your complaints. Mm. Yeah. And he'd say, "Life can be a bitch, but it might be a bit better when you finish your passages." Like you know. Yeah, that's what he's saying. I think like that. Yeah, <clears throat> he's had the link. Um, also, in that poem Genesis, uh, he turns up, you know, where he, <clears throat> he was giving the rib, as, a, as I said to my mother, you know, would be very, very down the middle. He, he was, I probably had, he probably influenced me more than her, obviously, because uh, I, I am a bit skeptical, and he was a skeptic, you know, he didn't buy into. Stories you'd be, people be telling you stood things, you know, the, the 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 politicians and the media, and he, he wouldn't believe what he'd read. You know, he'd say there's something going on there. You know, so, so it's a good way to be, I think. Yeah, he, he's, he kind of cut through the bullshit, basically. That's exactly it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want to give Genesis a read there? Or so maybe. And you you wouldn't have remembered um, Dan Hartnett. Did you remember Sean Hartnett? Well, that's what I was just looking up. I remember. The Sean Hart had a yellow car parked up outside, it. and it was like there was a t- a young TV program or children TV show at the time called Broom, and it was a very similar car to that. Uh, it always kind of intrigued me. I'd love to give it a drive, you know. So that, when, <laughs> when, 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 when I read that book, when you read that poem, when sorry, and you mentioned that, Dan Hart. That well, the man mentioned is his father, Dan Hartnett. He'd, okay. he'd be going back to uh, Cunningham, so this was called Andy's, as they called it, uh, having his drink regularly. And if you your father, we'll go back there too after a day's work now and again, not all, all the time. Anyway, uh, Genesis. It's, it starts very serious, but it ends up, I presume, where it should. Uh, Genesis. What ant- astrophysicists have discovered is the way that we were made. Exploding stars. Out of fluctuations we mattered. Out of the first sound of music, a big hit. That day without yesterday, without waiting, without echoes, without nothing to be done. Matter of scattering past, horizons catching up from the in- intimate of our atom seed to the infinite of our beliefs. What energy made us amazing. When man brought up Genesis, she took a turn to her grave tone, recognizing consequences, going to meet our maker, desiring to be better, to be in right with him, a thousand, thousand times more so, she'd correct me. When I compared our judgment day to meeting Father Enright or the keeper of his two-story house, that woman would never say, come in, you're welcome. Whenever I deliver their daily bread, instead, Tell your mother that I said thanks for all she has done. With that, she'd close the door. Dad omitted the minute detail. Would he like to give Mam the rib? His timing a sort of rebel throwaway, leaving me at four to explore the beginning another way. Dan Hafnett made the world with a spade and shovel he'd poke. So right then for my image of God, I believed. Dan was old enough. 
a pensioner with a stick, of stooped carriage, and, after reminiscing with a Guinness about the first day I imagined, he'd walk home to his cottage with his half door and light a candle. I really like the last couple of lines there. I paint a very nice image, like, you know, yeah. lighting the candle. and That's right, the light. I mean, and of course, the church still uses the image of the candle at, at, at Easter, you know, the, the light. So it, that's it's in there, you know. Yeah, you know, that was that was that. I also liked about your dad. I suppose there's just a part in one of the short stories there where I suppose you and George have gotten into a bit of grief for calling a neighbour who yeah, yeah. who wouldn't give the ball your slitter back an old bitch. Yeah. Your your father, I suppose, was kind of the kind of he, he was the decision maker for any punishments. I suppose just the kind of the read between the lines in the book. But yeah. he said, "Listen, it could be a lot worse. We will give the boys a break this time." But remember, I don't want to hear of any no any more name calling. That's and right, to yeah. overtly reassure ma'am, he said, "And do as your mother says." With that, he winked discreetly in our direction, and the case, if I may use that analogy, was closed. So I kind of quite like that. So up, yeah. I, there was a file. I think there, there, it's there. They sound like sorry. A bef before, before you go on, actually, my, my, my father was always ribbing my mother in that sense, I and mean, he, in a gentle way and an amusing way, and just messing. He, for example, I suppose it killed him eventually in one way. <clears throat> he used about uh, four or five spoons of sugar in his tea, and he'd have no milk, maybe a teaspoon of milk. But picture now. He'd, Typically four or five spoons of sugar, <clears throat> which was very bad, obviously. But if she said, if she said, will you stop doing that? That'll kill you. He'd throw in another two just to, to wind her up. <laughs> yeah. So that was, the, that was the way it would go on. Yeah. Did they seem like a brilliant foil for each other as a couple? Yeah, know? I think so. Yeah. Their opposites can attract sometimes, like, yeah. you know, but um, like I remember my father telling me that a fella came into the shop one day and Eddie's was, was your dad was from Newtown Chandram, a pro oh, Cork yeah. man. Yeah, sure. And, and he asked him one day, would Cork win? Yeah. They're in the All Ireland final. And his response was, will they win? Delay him without salt. <laughs> yeah, he, that was a common uh, expression of his. He had no time for Georgie Best for some reason. Kind of a gorilla from Belfast with this big head of hair. He, well, I, he, I I would agree with I would very much be in agreement with uh, your father there, Tom, because in my opinion, George Best was a low life who wasted his talent, who wasted the generosity of people giving him a new kidney, and regularly bragged about oh, abusing yeah. women physically and domestic abusers. So, in my eyes, yeah. I would be very very much yeah. in agreement yeah, with your dad sure, and yeah. his opinion of George yeah. Best. You know, yeah, he had, he had another another uh, line too in the shop. I say he wouldn't be in the shop that much. People there Sunday morning, or if, if there was a crowd, if there was a rush, um, where he, he, if people were slow on coming forward, he'd be trying to get out because he'd be patient enough that way. He said, "Speak up, you're you're amongst friends." <laughs> that was his line. You know? <laughs> or do you know what you're saying as well? When uh, I've used it myself actually, and I've used that last line as well in my own job when people are a bit quiet. You know, if, if people weren't really yeah. giving the answers I was looking for. Yeah. for Going to withhold information and ask them to speed up or speak up to their among friends. Another line, I suppose, a quote: "If you if you if you if you was buying a, if you if you bought someone a drink, you tell them to put inside their shirt." Oh yeah, that, that was, a, that put was that right. inside their, your shirt. Yeah, right, that's you know? right, yeah. And that to put here on your chest was another one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Will I be correct in saying he didn't suffer fools? No, he didn't. He, was, he, he definitely didn't. No, yeah. No, he did not. Yeah. Um, he basically would. He basically would go. Silent if he didn't agree with the thing, and you know. you'd know by his his nonverbals that uh, he he he'd send you the message you're talking shit, you know. Put it that way. Was there a story of a guy that was kind of when he buying a loaf of bread and he kind of was uh maybe testing his freshness a bit too much for your dad's liking? It could have happened. I don't remember. It, but, uh, but anyway, it, I suppose I, I, his response was. To come on, hurry up! It's 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 not a cow you're buying, like. Yeah, yeah, that would be. I, I, yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah, and it was there another time we were drilling for the F FCA, and some guy was kind of, wasn't standing up as straight as oh, he yeah. would have liked, because oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. obviously he was in the army himself, wasn't he? Like, yeah, that's right. Course, yeah. An ex-soldier, like, and he said, "You're yeah. in the army now, not not behind the yeah. plow," you know. 
<laughs> he probably did. I mean, I I had so much of my forgotten about him, but he would have. And he was a very. He walked very straight, you know. And he, he brought the army out with him, you know. Well, myself anyway, uh, and M- Michael, M- the two Michael Keatings, your brother-in-law and your nephew and myself, yeah. we went up to Crow Park to see New Hunchandrum play in the club hurling final oh, in yeah. 2004 as, as a tribute. Right. Yeah. A tribute here. He would have been a New Hunchandrum, wasn't he? So I suppose... To my, to my inner, really, but they were, they were the, one, the one parish and then that's like, like Raheen and Ashford, you know? Yeah. Well, I'd say he would have been shouting for New Hunch Andrew. Yeah, that's, oh, he would, yeah, of he course, been, yeah, yeah. He would have been a, a happy man. Yeah. And they won that day. And oh, yeah. It was funny. It's not It's not often I enjoy a game of football now, but I suppose the second game that day was between Caltra and Ungueltucht, the football okay. final. It was the battle of the Meehan brothers and the O'Shea brothers. Right. And it was a pure, just pure football, catch and kick, long before okay. this puke. Yeah. Football, yeah, right. blanket defence and all that. It just yeah. it was a great, yeah. it was a great day, and it was just a, it was a time at the time. Bernie O'Connor, Bill and Jerry O'Connor's father, was managing Cleedy at the time in two thousand and four. Okay. So there was a kind yeah. of a low interest in it. A connection, yeah. yeah right. And Cork were Cork were very good in senior level as well. Yeah, they, well yeah. they won the All Ireland right, yeah. next couple of that's years. Right, yeah. They haven't won one since, but that's a story for another day. But uh, you know, my father, my father was a great Corkman. You know, was, uh, I mean, in a sense, he he. Uh, he ruined me because I, I grew up loving Cork. You know, I mean, I, th- I thought I was a Cork man. And um, when I was, when I was eight, nine, ten, eleven, 10, 11, we, uh, I mean, I just keep, I just keep um, files of all the, all the, all the players. And I knew every, everyone on the Cork team, like you would know everybody on the Liverpool team now. And I'd be cutting away right, all these cutouts and whatnot. And um, I hated Tipperary, of course. And that was in the 60s. And Tipperary were very good in the 60s. And Cork wasn't great. With that in common um, as well, Tom, in my head, but yeah. Oh yeah, right. Well, definitely. Oh, geez, I hated Tipperary. It was like the Liverpool uh, Manchester United relationship between Cork and Tipperary. Um, would you believe uh, I I was at sixty six on Ireland Cork uh, the, the producer the surprise. Uh, I was on, on Hill sixteen. We went up that time. There was no such thing as tickets. You just went over and just you could decide the night before and get on the on the train and go to. Um, Go to the match and it was a big surprise. Justin McCarthy and uh, Charlie McCarthy and all of them were on it. Mick Waters and, and John Horgan. But they say, uh, in a sense, like he uh, he had me uh, believing I was a cop man. So in a sense, he was a, he was an outsider going into like, you know, He probably it, it never left me. It never left me. I still have great time for the red and white jersey. Yeah. And you, and you loved it so much. It. You actually, you actually went, went and ran a shop in the postal code in the postal address of County Cork. No, no, that's not me at all. That's the postal system. Oh, I know, but the I, postal I, system. Actually, I mean, I that's a, that's any time I go out and I give my address, I don't know, not Limerick or Cork, but the postal address is Broadford, Charleville, County Cork. Yeah. If I put down County Limerick on it, the postal system will cross it out, and uh, as if they 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 upset. County Cork because it goes through Charleville, you see. Yeah. So that makes it County Cork. And the other thing is, in my case, regarding my postal address, there's a Broadwood in County Limerick and there's a Broadwood in County Clare. And if I didn't put Charleville on it, all my postal uh, stuff would go to Clare or, or Limerick, say Fair Green and Limerick. Not only that, that but there's yeah. a Tom Maloney in both places. A Maloney's food <laughs> store, a Maloney's f- convenience store as well, because I, I remembered. Yeah. I, when I used to work with Plessy Foods for a summer, we used to drop to Maloney oh, yeah. and Broadford, which, similar enough to Border, it's in County, it's, it's County Limerick, but it's in the County of Clare, like. Yeah, right, yeah. So Same it, thing, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. it's a similar situation, which is quite apt, because I, yeah. I remember you were saying that some guy dropped a fridge one day thinking that he yeah. that he wanted it, but it was a, it was a <laughs> over and he did another hour place. drive ahead of him, like, after that. Yeah. This, this was six o'clock in the evening, I'd say, he made his day. <laughs> Before we move on to the the poems about your dad, there was um so there's a short story in your recent edition about a story you wrote as a kid called Once Upon a Time There Lived oh, yeah. a Bitch Who Had Seven Puppies. Oh yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. I suppose uh that, yeah. your your mother had kind of an issue with the word bitch being used in the house. Yeah, which sure. the bitch obviously is a female dog. Yeah, I, I I really enjoyed this particular paragraph here, in which in how your dad reacts to, to kind of you know yeah. her in her yeah. dislike of of the word. So, dad, however, was quite matter of fact. 
May I remind you, darling, that the bitch word is in the dictionary. Uh, and if others are ignorant about what it means, that's their problem. Doing what you're suggesting is like muzzling our son's mind. I'm sure you'll be the first person to agree that our young man here shouldn't have to apologize for knowing what he's talking about or for telling it as it is. And I hope you agree with me when I say it is my wish that when he grows up, he'll be his own man and won't be afraid to speak his mind without fear or favor as long as he has his facts. Saying as much, she winked to me before adding, however, if ma'am doesn't want you to be your own man, I'll go along with her decision. So what do you say, ma'am? <laughs> ma'am gave me a wink of her own before saying to dad, have it your way if that's the case. I accept that there's nothing wrong with the word bitch when referring to female dogs and the society we live in is liberal, well to a point. As for me, however, I'll stick with my own view on the matter. So I, I, enjoy, I enjoy reading that and I suppose kind of... Yeah, that's a, yeah it's, it's probably an accurate uh, um, description of the relationship they had. And we will come to your mother in a while now, but I suppose yeah, the, fact sure. that, the fact that I never met your dad and I suppose my own father would speak fondly of him as, as well. And they would have heard one or two, like John and Marie would have, would have met him as well. And, and, and that, you know, when, when he was quite young when he died, like he was in his late 60s, wasn't he? Yeah, 65, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, it just, it's it's great to, that the, he lives on through your work. Yeah. So w there's a couple of poems there about your dad, and I really enjoyed, enjoyed them. And I suppose they're very poignant. And the first one I just asked you to do with his father's cross, and this is where kind of the yeah. connection of the... The, the greyhound bond you had. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, yeah obviously, so I, I, the, the dogs play a major role, which we're going to come oh, to. Yeah. Without a doubt. Now, it, it turns out he, he, his life cycle, obviously, in Rahina is, is interesting as well because <clears throat> I'd say in the 50s, before I was being aware, he, he used to, um, he, was, he, was a big, he was a big fan of gardening and, and flower arranging. He's got a, say, the child of a show and all that. He's arranged flowers, you know. He was a big fan of gardening. Then he went off that and he, he was keep pigs. And I, I actually barely remember us having pigs. We used to have pigs. I, I remember one one time uh, where the sow shit bottles. Uh, some of those houses are gone now. But, um, and then he moved into... Um, Poultry, because obviously the cantor was was growing, and they had poultry a section. So sorry, he went into that. But obviously, there was a lot of work involved, and then he had he had a pub in Ashford for a while. So he was burning the the the, the can at every at every corner. So then he had um he also had a a tomato a glass house out in the backyard, uh, and that went belly up one night. It, it went on fire. He was he was keeping the um. The heat in there with a, a gas could the whole thing could have blown up with a uh, gas heater and he went on fire and the whole thing got burned so that finished that and then he went to, he started to keep greyhounds but here he kept greyhounds for the for the exercise and the the pleasure of it and of course he, when he had the pub he'd meeting fellows would be talking greyhounds because Ashford and Raheen uh, Broadford not maybe Raheen and less so uh, all strong greyhound country at the time it's very few around now. Greyhounds was to all that up to up to but the nineties. Uh, Greyhounds were a big, big, a big thing in West Limerick. So anyway, his poem, "My Father's Cross." Um, there is a cross. If you were going from going to to over the mountain to um, to Tralee, you ever travel that road? No, you 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 you'd leave yeah. you'd, you'd leave Abbey Field and you cross the mountain, right? Uh, and you'd come to a cross at, at one point about maybe six or seven miles. This side of uh, Trilly, it's actually called Dan Petty Andy's Cross. But uh, we just got by the moment I'd got the dogs in Trilly that road, and, that, and you would hit you hit Trilly at the right side where the dog track was at that side of the town as well. <clears throat> but anyway, he um, one one evening we were going back, and, and a fellow, a local fellow, he's dead now, the rest, Patsy Doody, was in the back, he was in the back of the van, and my father passenger seat, and we 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 did dog at the back which does his dog the star right that turns up in the poem um so he uh i was obviously flying because i was caught for time uh when you know when i, when I was working and um so i came to the cross and i screeched to pull up because i had to give right of way so he, he nearly fell out the front window that was that's the that's the the moment but my father's cross afterwards then when he died my father died and my son Patsy Doody was still going to the docks and Trilly before Patsy passed away. Every time we'd come to that cross, Patsy would say, 
your father's cross. <laughs> so he called it my father's cross. So then Petty Andrews became my father's cross. And of course, it has the meaning of like, I was his cross. He had to suffer this speed driving, which I was going on with. Uh, I still try to, I still, I'm not as bad, I think, but I. Which actually um, made him cross as well, quite aptly, which is your. Well, on the, on the occasion, he, he got, he, he caused him to, to, to lose his cool. So anyway, the, the the dog in question there was there was such a dog called Son of Chad, and he ran in in he was a right rogue. He was like gentle loyalist now. He he was a rogue as well. He um he was running in Cockburn in the Western Road, the old track, and he fought. And of course, if a dog turns the head, you know, if there wasn't a can actually fight, they just turn the head and start playing with the next dog. They're suspended immediately, and in order to win, if if they have to if they're an old race again, they have to. Have, uh, two satisfactory clearance trials. In other words, they have to stand behind. You have to, you have to get two dogs, two two slow duffers, and get your dog to stand behind. And, and, and he, he, your dog is behind him, and he goes around the track. But he has to pass them. They'll be they will be slow, and he will pass them. If he has interest in passing, he'll pass them. Otherwise, uh, he will uh, he'll do the same again. So that's what happened in this case. Anyway, this is the poem, my father's cross. You refer to your greyhound as Chaddy. But I recall that his public name was Son of Chad. It was logical because his mother's name was Chad, pet name Fiery. I recall too that you fussed over him. Recall the way you looked at the fit frame of your pride and joy. Unfortunately, your heartache. One Monday night in July, when, as you put it, he broke your melt. Down the back straight, his challenge was sweet, still driving towards the leader on the outside. But under his Aussie muzzle, he growled, then stalling, turned his head on the bend. Everybody heard the public address. Son of Chad had been suspended pending a satisfactory clearance trial. Even then, you couldn't believe that he could do what you had seen, what had really happened, rationalised that it was the other's fault. And when he jumped up on you next morning as if he had won and done nothing wrong, you promised there and then to clear his name. Would round up two duffers, your fingers crossed for the following week for him to cruise past to exonerate his name just in time to give him a change of scenery. You entered him in a stake in Tralee, placed him in his cage in my highest van, I admit that I was flying on the night, first at the hairpin, I had to break hard, then barely stalling to give right of way at the staggered cross five miles from the from the track, such that you were finally jolted, perhaps out of running in your head the impending race, outmatching my favourite FM rock. You attacked you attacked me, sounding like you like you might crack. For fuck's sake, Sterling Moss, will you slow down? And give Chaddy some sort of chance in the back. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed the last two lines there. Like, you know, it's brilliant. Yeah. Just as, as an aside note, when you mentioned Sterling Moss, Roy Keane's yeah. father passed away there a few years ago, and that was actually his nickname. Oh, yeah. He was Mossy Keane, but Roy used to bring back Sterling. Back to Mossy, yeah. and, and I suppose okay. he'd be he'd be oh, yeah. using the Sterling as currency in the in the bar in for drink, like, you yeah. know. But um, that was nicknamed yeah, Sterling Mass. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> no, no, I, I really, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Actually, your uncle Willie had a dog one time called Gentle Loyalist. By the way, did you know that? I wouldn't be found the story, name. No, a story behind him, nothing to do with the dog per se. But I think I mentioned to you about my father's, my father's, uh, uh, some of his quips. You know, one of his, one of his uh, legendary one he had in Cantor. It became a legendary one. He didn't make it that way. He, he actually said it. One afternoon, um, and, 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 and Peter Quinlan actually asked him, they knew this dog, Gentle Loyalist, he was doing good time, you know, in trials, and um, he was he was to be racing, and my father put him in for a race in Yard. And uh, I said it was, it was known, not generally known, but obviously word gets out in these things, that the dog was capable of winning, you know. He was doing the time. But as it turns out, it was a bit of a role, the same dog. That's another story. Anyway, um, Peter met my father in the office 
it's probably about three o'clock in the afternoon of the race. He was racing that night in Yard. So if I'd be going home and straight off to Yard, I'd be with him. Peter says to him, um, when will the dog be running, Eddie? So he, my father says to him, shortly, Peter. Now, shortly, it could mean anything, obviously. <laughs> it could be next weekend, but that's, that's very nice. They, that was his cuffed answer, or his, his, his quiet answer. And uh, as, as I said, regarding the dog himself, it turned out, I mean, looking back, the dog was always second. But he, he was that kind of a dog. What was happening was... Was like pool saw, was he? Maybe a bit of that. <clears throat> he just was running with the dogs. and uh, at, at the, I, I'd say he was reared over, uh, at, obviously, with a sheepdog, right? And he was probably always running with the sheepdog, so he'd be running alongside the sheepdog. So he got that habit, I imagine. So he was always running with the leader, but not quite passing the leader. You understand? Again, so like Liverpool. Was... <laughs> Again, like <laughs> finishing Liverpool. second. <laughs> finishing Man second. City. Yeah. Those gentle eyes. It was before the troubles too, uh, which back in the I'd say about six or seven or eight, maybe I'm not sure. But it was before the, the mm -hmm. troubles and not, which would be in a dodgy you name, know, put on a dog uh, after sixty nine. Oh Jesus, yeah. <laughs> That's another story. There's a good connection between you and your dad, I suppose. It, it resulted, I suppose, in your firstborn being yeah. named after him, Edmund, right, yeah. who was my best man at, at my wedding. And you okay. named your second born after yourself, Thomas. So okay. a, sh a sh yeah. shout out to, to and your wife, born <laughs> and, you know, and Kasia and the whole lot. Yeah. I suppose partly too, when I was in Munchens, he, he was he was the only one who actually wrote to me. I mean, he was obviously in, in, in Cantor. He, He'd have time in the afternoon to sit down and write a letter. So he was, he, I got a letter every week at least, you know, from me, like keeping me up to speed on how the dogs were doing and different things that I'd be interested in and what was happening locally to a point, you know. Yeah. So, well, fair play, that, that the time. That yeah, that's right. So, and you could tell even the, the story about leaving home forever, and you mentioned that earlier is a short story about that. And you yeah. can tell, all right, that it was just you can you can sense the. The kind of anxiousness and the kind of the, the sorrow that your parents kind of had on the last day or before you went into Munchens, and it, 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 it's, it's written very yeah. poignantly. Um, yeah. So before um, we leave your dad, literally, um, there's yeah. another poem there called "My Dad's Leaving," which you describe oh, the yeah, night he yes. night he passed away suddenly, and right, I, yeah, yeah. A very poignant poem. Yeah, <clears throat> no, the Michael is my is my Keating. Uh, he rang me up for the Friday evening around tea time, just after six o'clock, I'd say, to say that um, my father left taking a bad turn. So that's the reference to, to, to Mike. And of course, I mentioned the uh, shades, in case people don't understand what shades mean. It's it's the souls, and that's a common term for them in, in, in writing, to refer to them as shades. And the oval, the oval is the um, <clears throat> Sharon, the, the guy who, 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 who drives the boat, uh, Pilots the board across the list. He likes to be uh, to be get a backhander. So I mean, that was that was the money, the oval. My dad's leaving. When I answered the phone call, Michael said that all of a sudden you had decided you were emigrating to the promised land, that you were already on the pier, and although Ma'am had telephoned for the priest, you were going to take the latest boat on the list. I drove through the night, the speed limit, questioning the timing of your decision. You had never told me about this sudden plan. Michael added that you had taken it to a new habit, irregular breathing. From the way he described it, I couldn't wait. Everybody knew about these trips, their one-way nature, begetters of tears, perpetual conveyor belts for shades, Heard also about Sharon's experience, reputed as the best in the business, his ruthless streak, eye out for oval bribes. But I needed to meet you at the pier, to hug you, sobbing in first degree shock, just as I did the last time, <clears throat> when I was ten, as I recall, you said, as I stared at Rover on his straw bed. It's all right, son, but I'm afraid he's dead. Uh, it's very poignant, that. Again, you're you're bringing in the the connection with the dogs as well. You both had there, like you know, so yeah. Right. So that was probably a point of dog. Was uh, that's another story. <clears throat> but obviously, that was a huge loss. I suppose he he was kind of dead before his time, really, wasn't he? You know, yeah. kind of 
He was. He just retired that, that summer. He retired in June. He was dead in November. But that's the, that's the thing about people who were so busy. And so even for yourself, I know at the at the back of your book there is, is there's a nice um about I suppose you're mentioning how retirement is similar to being presented with a box of honeycomb mint oh, yeah. and praline chocolates heaven <clears throat> in the box to suggest the three variances are analogous to reading, writing, and relaxing wouldn't be altogether invalid. So I suppose you, you're enjoying you're enjoying your retirement and you're enjoying it because obviously you put in serious hours there and seven days a week oh, in yeah. the shop there. Yeah. But it just made, you mentioned about your dad when he retired, some people need to be in fifth gear all the time. Yeah. And when, they, when it drops yeah. down, they can... Yeah. Well, he was... Um... He, he, I mean, he had the dogs, and he, his day was taken up with it. He wasn't bored or anything, you know. This, well, he, I mean, he had issues before that. I mean, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, it was sudden in one sense, but it wasn't in another sense. You know, this, <clears throat> it just, um, it just got a sudden heart attack, and that was the end of it. But, but he had issues before that, you know. Um, so but it came, it came as, it came as a shock when it happened. Absolutely, I can only imagine. 